Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. As you can see, folks, I'm holding the voters pamphlet this year, Oregon primary election, May 20, 2014. Bottom line, folks, this is it. This is going to be our last show, and we're going to wrap up, if you will, the, the primary election. And uh, come Wednesday, we're going to be people are going to be out there voting and whatever. And and again, it's still there, you know. And and please use your voters pamphlet and other material. I would suggest very very, very strongly that you use the voters pamphlet as much as you possibly can. Uh, again, there's been quite a quite a primary. Uh, uh, the expectation is, that, as usual, is there's not going to be many voters. We don't have a presidential election coming up. But the bottom line is that um, uh, hopefully you will participate. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to wrap it up by basically bringing on folks who are, who are new to the process. You know, in all due respect, that's what it's all about. You know, we've got, we have an open process, and uh, I think it's very important that um, we understand that. And, and it's always, we always welcome, if you will, people to get involved. It's tough, trust me, it's tough to get out here and sign your name and say that you're running for office. Because when you do this, when you as, as a newcomer, if you're not an encumbered or this, that, and the other, you don't get the funding sources. In most cases, you don't get all in the, in the endorsement whatsoever in the media aspect of it. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough game. Uh, and it, I might add that uh, from my experience and my exposure in the, in, in, uh, through the years, uh, it's the only time, it's the only time within, uh, within the voter situation that mm -hmm. you can lie if you want to. And then if you if if you uh, if you want to challenge the person uh, from the media standpoint, they'll say, "Well, give me an ad." <laughs> and if you got the money for an ad, you can you can counter it. But otherwise, you you can't. But my point is that um, uh, it's a very difficult situation. So what we're going to do to close out the voters pamphlet, uh, the voters, or, or I'm sorry, the Oregon primary election, is that we're going to interview uh, several candidates uh, who have basically just gotten into uh, the um, the races and gotten into the process. And we're going to get a little feel, it's a feedback from each of them. Okay, well, start. start we're going to start out with uh, Jeremiah Johnson, who's running for Metro President, and Jeremiah is here with me, uh, and we're going to give him an opportunity to share with you one why he's running, why he's running for office, and uh, maybe hit some of the the highlighted positions uh, in Metro. Okay, uh, the sitting the sitting incumbent uh, is Ted Hughes, right? Tom Tom Hughes. Hughes. Ted Hughes. I don't want to get to Ted. It's Tom Hughes, and so. So that's what we do. So, 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 um, Jeremiah, why don't you start off with initially? Why are you running? Well, I I chose to run back in 2010. Okay. I didn't see a lot of difference between Bob Stacy and Tom Hughes on a lot of their positions, and at the time, none of them were neither of them were taking on the positions that I thought were more important to me that Metro should be taking on, and. Uh, when Tom Hughes won, it kind of solidified that decision for me because he was a backer of the CRC, which I was against. Okay, all right, good, good. Oh, well, in fact, let's jump right up in there. You said he was a backer of CRC? Yes, he, he's, he's been uh, known as a supporter. In fact, that was the one issue that really kind of separated him from Bob Stacy on the other issues that they were both running on their platforms at the time was that he was a major supporter of the CRC and, and Bob Stacy was not. Mm -hmm. What what would, be, what would have been your position? What was your position on the CRC? I didn't like the plan. Um, as soon as the Army Corps of Engineers said it was too short, we should have scrapped it. Um, since then, they've been trying to rehash the same plan over and over again, wasting uh, as much as three hundred million dollars or more to private investors and and uh, consultants and stuff like that. And to me, it just it's almost embezzlement at this point. You know, we've got more than enough money spent for two bridges, and we haven't even broke ground on one. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we still are going to have to fix or replace the bridge we have. Mm -hmm. And to have a bridge that's too short is just it would have crippled our region because we're a port town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a lack of oversight on a lot of different issues. So do you look? Are you looking maybe looking at a, another bridge? You think we should have another bridge? I I would like to get to where we get more jobs, more income coming in, more tax sheets coming in from a better economy so that we can start looking at responsibly paying for things instead of trying to invest um, from the, the, the front end on these big projects when we're still, so much of our in infrastructure is, is struggling. Okay. Um, there's too many people without jobs to, to not 
to worry about spending too much money on a bridge ramp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to throw out several issues here that I think tend to resonate with the voters, especially at this point in time. Uh, what about TriMet? There's been a lot being said about TriMet in, in sort of a historical situation. That was the primary issue I got into. Neither uh, Tom Hughes nor Bob Stacy, who is uh, another uh, council member on, on the council right now, um, he took over Barbara Roberts' seat in 2012. Um, no one has wanted to restructure TriMet and Metro is the only one in their charter that has sort of the permission to do a restructure of TriMet and you have an agency that's a private nonprofit corporation they are taking big bonuses for their ex executives while running in the red and risking bankruptcy in fact there was a, a report a few months ago in I believe the Oregonian the Willamette Week that talked about how they were in danger of going bankrupt and and faltering soon and that runs in a situation of where we need a transit system. We're going to have a transit system, but who's going to run it? Are we going to run our own transit system? Or are we going to let it fall and run into a bankruptcy situation where the federal government will come in and take over our transit system? And already we have a transit system that doesn't serve everybody. We have a lot of people on the east and west side uh, outside of the central Portland area who are being ignored and those are areas where a lot of seniors live and they depend upon those bus services mm -hmm. and they're not getting the bus services so we're getting more bus services cut while the price of the bus system goes up and they're taking payouts for the top executives so mm -hmm. I would like to see a situation where those people are elected and major projects that people have had a lot of problems with like the Milwaukee uh, light rail system those kind of things should be voted on, and not just people being told what's going to happen to them with their tax money. What about your plan in regards to being able to reach out to those uh, those folks that are outlining, not not so close to the to the bus lines? Mm -hmm. What would be your plan? Well, it's interesting because uh, one of the biggest problems we have is not enough crosstown routes. Um, it, it's it's one thing to have you know major bus lines and max trains that run east west but if you don't have enough north south routes then there's a lot of people who aren't going to be able to benefit from any of those high speed lines uh, whether it's a bus or a train so we really have to have more connection routes um, it's unacceptable that any bus runs more than every half hour and i live in, a, in an area where it'll be 45 minutes to an hour before a bus will come and it's a major street it's cornell i mean cornell road can't have a bus that runs more than every half hour it, it, it just seems insane to me that a city planner or a metro pl planner will put forward a plan that doesn't have adequate bus service um, right now around the rest of the country we see ridership rates going up and Portland has been sort of the golden child for many decades as to how to run a bus system properly and what a great bus system looks like, yet our ridership rates are declining every day. More people are losing faith in our bus system than are gaining faith in using the bus system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another area, uh, let's, let's talk about Intel. Let's talk about jobs for a minute. I mean, right. it's yeah. probably, Intel is probably one of our largest employers here in the state of Oregon. It, it is the largest. It right? is. It, it is, is one. Of, uh, it's in the top three, I right, believe. The top three aspect of it. And we have been subsidizing them for quite some time, even at the at the, at the initial inception. Right, right. And right. they're constantly coming back to the table for more monies at times, okay? Mm -hmm. In the form of tax breaks and things of that mm -hmm. nature, right? Okay. So how, how do you deal with that? Now, how, how are you responding to that? Well, currently they, they just received a report that they're having, uh, they had significant losses in their last quarter, which will mean that they're now looking at layoffs instead of increasing jobs. Now, mm -hmm. we have, as part of the plan for expanding their campus in Hillsborough, a promise of hiring a certain number of people. And the problem now is we don't have any guarantee that those jobs that are going to be filled, those new jobs for the new facility are going to be filled from actual Oregonians, from actual people who live in the metropolitan region around mm -hmm. Portland and, and Hillsborough. And so are we going to lose those jobs because they're just going to move people from Intel campuses from around the rest of the nation? So that's something we're going to have to look at and put pressure on them and possibly get some sort of return on our investment mm. in them if we're not going to be able to get those jobs out of them. Uh, another issue, too, and I know this from living in the Beaverton area, and I know this from uh, friends and relatives and, 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 and other people that I've spoken with throughout the, the west side, is you have people who work at Intel, um, but only Hillsborough is really getting the majority of those tax receipts. And so you have increased traffic and increased housing demands in places like Beaverton, Aloha, Forest Grove, Cornelius. And those are all people who work at Intel, but because they 
Hillsborough is getting the majority of those tax receipts, the infrastructure to support Intel is actually being taken over by mostly taxpayers still at this point. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's kind of creative. I mean, so your suggestion is that um, uh, if there are any layoffs or whatever, hopefully there won't be folks from uh, that uh, from Argonian uh, that are basically what, what, what part of the negotiation on the front end. Right. Am I right? Exactly. That's the whole idea. Yeah. So, and then another point that you you raised, I thought was interesting. So the other suggestion is that uh, any negotiation with any possibility of a, a business coming within the area, they, part of that deal would be they'd have to fix those, those identify those jobs, at least a percentage of those jobs right. for the metropolitan area. Right. And if we didn't get those jobs, then whatever tax benefits, whatever um, cost benefits that we've given them, we would be able to get a return on that because the, the whole point of giving those uh, tax cuts and cost benefits towards them in building their infrastructure is that we would get the jobs that will lead to income that will lead to tax infrastructure for us through 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 payroll taxes so if we're not getting that we're going to have to have some sort of return on our investment okay. so anyway so the funding source on the front end mm -hmm. would be pretty well uh, standard i mean be stable if you will yes so it's 100 percent right off the bat and it's benefiting right. benefiting the voter right hopefully okay yeah. good 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 <laughs> all right let's talk about the other thing that's been in the press in regards to metro is the hotel Right. Talk a little bit about that. First, give, them a, give us a brief description of what, what's the problem. What, what is the issue? Well, the issue is they want to build a giant hotel to go next to our convention center so that we can attract bigger conventions. Ultimately, I don't have a problem with that, except that we already have a, a saturation of hotels right around the convention center. We don't need one big major hotel. We actually have a lot of private hoteliers around the, the, the convention center right now that at best only have 50 percent residency rates and you know you can check that out yourself on expedia.com you just you can pick any day and you can see that there's plenty of open rooms so if we build a big hotel like that and give them sort of subsidies to help them stay in business it's going to put a big crunch on on hoteliers that are local small businesses that are already here uh, it's going to take away more residencies from them and more profits from them in directing to to that and we've seen um, a lot of these big convention center hotels be built around the United States and the success rate is not very high probably one in three actually makes some sort of profit the rest of them have all gone into bankruptcy in fact Vancouver right across the river uh, attempted to do a similar thing a few years ago and it was a big disaster um, so we're banking on pipe dreams of getting like a, a NBA all-star show here but that's not guaranteed. And there's so many other elements that go into big conventions like that. You know, who's going to pay for the increased police presence and overtime? Who's going to pay for all the cleanup? Who's going to pay for all these things? It's not just a big hotel that we need to look at for bigger conventions. Um, they say it's always been part of the plan, but the convention center has been there for close to 30 years now without a hotel. So to me, it's just a bad investment. And to give it to a, an out-of-state corporation like Hyatt, and to promise $60 million of our own tax money to them as a subsidy, uh, which still hasn't given, been given by uh, Mr. Hughes any adequate explanation of why a multi-billion dollar corporation needs some sort of guaranteed payout from our own taxes when we need those taxes for other parts of Metro's infrastructure. But you're not opposed, right, if a private entrepreneur would come up and build a, build a building on their own, don't have any problems. Oh, absolutely. If Hyatt wants to put up 100% of the cost, yes. then that, that's fine for us. Uh, another issue, too, is they promised these jobs to be union jobs, which I would love to see, but uh, there's actually, in our state constitution, a ban on government agencies supporting or, or forcing unions on a shop. And... You know, Hyatt's got a lot of lawyers. I'm sure they've seen that loophole. I'm sure they're going to exploit it. They're going to build the hotel. Um, I've talked to union members. A lot of them are concerned about it. Some are saying, well, let, let's let the courts decide. I've seen a lot of court decisions come through, not in necessarily the, the common people's favor recently. So I'm not, uh, I would like to take care of the situation up front mm -hmm. rather than letting things sort of fall to the courts and, and hoping that they make the best decision for the average everyday person who's going to be getting those jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I think about the, another thing that comes up when I think about the elephants, you know, down at the mm -hmm. Metro Zoo aspect of it, in terms of who's responsible for that situation. I, I'm also thinking about the situation with reference to the vets, you yeah. know, and, uh, and how the secretary of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the VA is taking right. the hit 
for the issues that are be, that, that, that that's being discussed about the vets and some of them dying because of the lack of being able to get, get treated and this that and the other but now here's the secretary taking the hit and they're asking him to resign and then i think about the zoo aspect of it and what happened to the to the elephant right but is there some comparison there what do you think absolutely what, you know who should take who should take who should take on that responsibility the, the, the responsibility falls directly on the council because they're the, the top peer of Metro's management. And if they didn't know about the situation, then that's a failure on that part because they should have known about the situation. And if they did know about the situation, then they're complicit in what was going on. Um, so either way, it's kind of a guilt on both sides of the coin because I don't, I don't think any management on that level should have the excuse that they didn't know what was going on because mm -hmm. that just leads to a, a perception of incompetency. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they knew that when they laid off the zoo director because she was just following the policy and the procedures that they gave them. So if, if she had some sort of failure, then, then they're trying to put that on her as not following their procedures and policies, but they won't tell us what those procedures and policies mm -hmm. are because they know that they themselves are complicit in that. So who was her who was her supervisor? Uh, it would be Metro Council. The Metro, Metro as Council, as far as I know, because the directors of each of their departments are directly accountable to to Metro Council. If in fact that would have happened on your watch, would you have accepted the resignation? Uh, I think I would have had to uh, accept a resignation. Um, Part of why I'm going into this is to, is to try to get the proper care for the elephants. Okay. The the bond measure that was proposed in the elephant sanctuary that, that they have uh, put into plan is too little too late. I mean, we're talking about animals that roam thousands of miles a day, and they've only expanded a one-acre uh, area to a six-acre area. That's, you know, that's like giving a dog that was suffering in a tiny little closet a whole bedroom to play in. It's still not enough for a dog that needs to run and play. Elephants are kind of like that. They need to run, they need to play, they need to be able to go uh, long spaces. And all the elephants right now are suffering. Uh, mm. So if, if, if we have problems with foot problems and uh, the spreading of disease, two elephants have tuberculosis right now. If we have those kind of problems and we know that the expansion that we have proposed right now uh, isn't enough, then they're still going to have those problems and it's just going to end up costing us more money. And uh, another big issue too is whether or not it's sustainable or feasible to have sort of a breeding program. And I think a lot of zoos in, have been eyeing the money that they can get from these breeding programs but not really looking at how the animals suffer because of that. Uh, and it, it's something that I definitely think is, needs to end because uh, we're not really preserving the species at this point, we're actually doing more harm than good. So maybe, uh, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but are you suggesting maybe that if you were, if once elected, let's say you are looking at the whole issue of the zoo aspect, you would put animals that uh, would be treated a little bit more humane? Because, you know, the kids, Absolutely. The kids yeah. still want to come out here and see the animals, you know what I'm saying? Right. And they don't. They want to see them close up. We, right. we, don't, we don't want to go on a safari to, to figure out where they are, you know what I'm saying? Right. And it's pretty well contained in terms of where it's at. So the idea is to hopefully get animals in there they can steal chickens and things of that nature you know yeah definitely smaller animals uh seem to do better in like zoo type habitats right. um larger animals especially intelligent large animals suffer immeasurably mm -hmm. and we've already got a situation where uh, a lot of zoos around canada and the united states have given up their elephants and sent them to sanctuaries mm -hmm. like paws down in california and we have a situation in california now where they've passed a ban on raising orcas and, and keeping orcas in captivity because they're a large intelligent species and it's only a matter of time before that sort of momentum grows throughout the entire united states so it to me it's, it's not whether or not we get give up our elephants it's how and when are we going to make them suffer longer and sort of hold on to the past for as long as we can or are we going to take that humanitarian step of being uh, proactive about it and saying look they've had enough they've suffered enough let's do the right thing now okay on that note tell the, tell the viewing voters why should they vote for you at this point in time real quick one you should definitely vote for me because i'm going to be honest and i'm going to be inclusive and I'm going to be able to put all the books and all the decisions out there so that people aren't mis mystified by any of the elements of different decisions, different contracts, different agencies that Metro runs. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy right now that we have a voting district in Metro of about 1.5 million voters. And that's 
almost as big as our senator and our governor. And not enough people know what Metro is. So including people in the processes of Metro and letting people know exactly what Metro is, what Metro does, where they're getting their money from and how they're spending it is very important to me, not just as a resident of Metro, but making sure that people get the equity that they deserve out of their tax money of who they vote for in Metro Council. Jeremiah, this has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, there you have it, folks. Jeremiah Johnson running for chair uh, of Metro. Um, and uh, again, uh, I think it's really good. Again, get out and vote. Pull out the ballots and vote for one of them. You know, if you, if, if in all due respect, if, uh, if there's a, let's see, if, if you didn't pull out 51%, right? 50% plus one vote. 50% plus one vote. Okay, fine. Okay, well, hey, get out and vote. Jeremiah, thanks again. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with our guests. All right. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, Hi. folks. Again, uh, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest. Um, again, uh, we've got um, we've got two candidates uh, we're going to be interviewing at this point in time. Very interesting candidates because we're talking about the metropolitan area aspect of it here. Uh, we just recently uh, we we interviewed, if you will, the um, um, the mo mo uh, metro area right, with, with Jeremiah and whatever. And so now we're going to go through the city, and we're also going to go through the county, mm -hmm. which is great. We got two. Uh, I wouldn't say up and coming. Uh, the, these are already, they're already here. <laughs> exactly. And, and they're talking to the people. <laughs> Trust me, they're talking to the people. And we want to give them the opportunity to give you, give, give that lasting word, if you will, to get you to get out and vote. So this is, you know, we got the voters pamphlet here. We want you to pull those, pull those voters, uh, vote, those voters ballots, if you will, out of the can, wherever they are. Exactly. And vote for someone. <laughs> yes, you know, vote. They're, they're open to whatever. Just, but vote. Get out and vote and exercise your right. Don't complain after the fact. Right. You know, you got to get out there and vote. So I've got two exciting uh, folks that are sitting here with me right now, and we're going to give them an opportunity to share with you some some of their thoughts. We've had them both on uh, here at the Voters Digest uh, in the past, and we're just excited about the fact that they're here. And another reason I might want to share, just as a little small commentary aspect of it, if you notice from the media standpoint, sometimes you got to look be beyond that. Take the voters pamphlet, look at what these folks are, and uh, and if necessary, you can give them a call because they'll give you a number, and you can give them a call and talk to them over the phone or whatever. Because often what happens is the incumbent pretty well get all the endorsement of the, the newspaper aspect of it, the media aspect of it, uh, their encumbered aspect of it. They use and some of them use their staff. I mean, I've seen it. I've been there. And the whole nine yard. And so it's, it's not a fair system, but that's the way it is. You know, as I indicated at the beginning of the show, I said, this is the only time that, in all due respect, you can lie. <laughs> and then the media will ask you, well, do you have any money to put an ad together? <laughs> Other than that, it's a tough situation. It's the only place that the, 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 the media and, 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 and the other responsible folks are not going to challenge, if you will, an incumbent using their staff. I've seen that also, too, in the situation. Or if not that, uh, going out and meeting the group and having people at an agency sitting up in the audience and then pointing out and identifying it and saying, what, this is what I've done over here, right, John? That kind of thing. So, you know, so my point is that maybe we need to look at that from the future standpoint, because otherwise that will motivate voters to get out and vote, because a lot of folks just don't want to even get involved. It's really a sad note. But that's my commentary right now. Let's get right into the, 
uh, interviewing these two young people right here. For position two at the city council, we got Sharon Maxwell. Good here. afternoon. And we got Teresa Redford uh, with yes, Multnomah County. Okay, position number two. Yes, both sir. of these gentlemen been out there working. They both been on the show. Yes, Sharon, thank you. Why don't we do? Let's do a little wrap up. Why don't you just kind of, hey, it's it's, uh, it's you. Sure. Just, you know, talk to the voters. Tell us, tell us one. What are some of the things? Maybe, maybe give them just a little brief about um, who's sharing sure, for a moment. Sure, sure. And then uh, secondly, why you're running. Sure. Okay, and who you're running against. Sure. And, uh, and what are some <laughs> of the specifics in terms of why you feel that the voters should elect you? Awesome. Thank well, you so much, Bruce. Sure, okay. And good afternoon, Portlanders over the 95 neighborhoods. I am Sharon Maxwell, and I'm running to be your next city commissioner. I want to do a shout out today to all of the 95 neighborhoods, if I could, calling out Portland downtown, Linton, Arlington Heights, Northwest Districts, Pearl Town, Chinatown, Goose Hollow, Hillside, Sylvan Highlands, Northwest Industrials, Northwest Heights, Forest Park, West Portland Park, Marshall Park, Collins View, Far Southwest, Arnold Creek, Crestwood, Hillsdale, Markham, Hayhurst, Hilly Heights, Ash Creek, Multnomah, Bridal Mile, South Burlingame, South Portland, Homestead, Maplewood, Arbor Lodge, Centennial, Gilbert Heights, Lentz, Pleasant Valley, Overlook, Piedmont, Sunderland, Woodland Park and Russell, Wilkes, Hazelwood, Glen Fair, Mill Parks, Park Rose Heights, Park um, Argate and Park Rose, Ardenwall Johnson Creek, Mount Scott, Selwood Moreland, East Moreland, Brentwood Darlington, Reed Woodstock, Foster and Powell, Creston and Kenilworth, Brooklyn and East Columbia, Hayden Island, Hosford Abernathy, Crest Kenilworth, Foster and Powell, Reed and Woodstock, South Tabor, Mount Tabor, Richmond, Hosford, Abernathy, uh, University Park, Rose City Park, Roseway, Sumner, Madison South, Cully, Hollywood, Beaumont and Wilshire, Gullivan Such, uh, Lloyd Center, Kenton, Cathedral Park, St. John's, Humboldt, Boise, King and Vernon, Sabin, Alameda, Woodlawn, Irving, Concordia, Elliott, Grant Park, once again, Thank you so much for this last six months of connecting with me, who I'm running to be your next city commissioner. I have the skills. I have the experience. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a community activist. I'm a community builder. I've been connecting with the people throughout the city. And one of the things that they have brought to my attention is, are you here just for the votes? Or are you going to come back and see us? I'm coming back to see you because within my first year, I will have town hall meetings. I want to know what your ideas are, what your concerns are. I've heard through these last six months, the very crucial things that are very concerning is the police excessive force policies, making sure that citizens truly have a voice at, citizen, uh, at City Hall. It's time for change in the city of Portland to restore oversight, transparency, integrity, and accountability. I want to make sure that as your next city commissioner, your voice is being represented as a public servant. That's who I am, Sharon Maxwell, a public servant running to make sure that your voice is heard and listened to. And I'm here to listen. I've heard you. I've listened. And I'm listening. And I will continue to listen throughout my four years. I'm asking for your votes. And I'm asking for four years to turn the city around, to work with the mayor, with the business community, with the citizens, with our young people, to be that role model, to be able to show them that there is something different about what this city is all about. It's time to connect citizens to City Hall, the People's Hall. Sharon Maxwell, Sharon Maxwell for Portland.org. You can reach me at 503 419 And I'm looking forward to working with um, all of the commissioners, with the county, with everyone throughout the 95 neighborhoods as we go into these next four years. Thank you. Okay, Sharon, that, that's, hey, that's sound, boy. I, I tell you, you covered them all. Yes, I you did. covered them all. That, yes, that, that, yes. That's the first year. That's, 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 that's good. 95. That's, good. that's a call out and a shout out. That's a good. I like that. I like yes. that. Well, hey, let's, let's go with this commissioner. Okay. <laughs> I take it that the, the incumbent who's sitting there right now is, um, is, just happens to have the Water Bureau. Yes, he does. Okay, so now how would you handle First of all, let's, t let's tell the viewing audience, you know, one, what, what's, the, what's the problem? What's the issue? 
and then talk about then what, what, what's your solution? Sure. So the issue here is oversight, trust, and accountability. As part of my platform, I'm bringing forth a shared uh, uh, single member district. Single member districts. We elect city commissioners per districts, just like the county commissioners are elected per districts. That way you have an accountability with the commissioner, with the citizens in their district. They have an oversight and a real connection on infrastructure, capital development projects, what's really going on, a pulse. And I just don't believe at this time that the commissioner at hand, Nick Fish, has a pulse. He's been very disconnected. Nick has all been all about Nick during these last six years. And he doesn't recognize that people's voice are important. He's been very dismissive as I talk to people in Northwest Portland, Southwest Portland, Southeast Portland, when they push through the uh, parking meters at Washington Park. So now all citizens who visit Washington Park are going to have to pay a parking fee. Mm -hmm. When we just passed a $500 million bond to be able to rehabilitate and renovate the zoo, why would citizens have to uh, pay for parking up there mm -hmm. at Washington Park and the zoo? So Mr. Fish is not connected to listening to the voice of citizens. If we were kind enough and generous enough to uh, pass that bond and we're paying out of our hard mm -hmm. Uh, work capital, you know, in our jobs, well, why would we have to continue to give more and more? And so it's just really time to recognize that citizens' voice matters, that it counts, and that you can't keep putting extra heavy burdens on people and expect them to keep coming out of their pockets. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another issue on the table. It's, it's called the water. Yes, well, what, yes. What, is, what are we talking about? What, what's the argument? Well, the argument is is that, first of all, you've, you wasted the uh, taxpayers' money. You spent over $126 million from the Water Bureau and Bureau of Environmental Services on pet projects and inappropriate projects that were not even related to those bureaus. That's gone outside of the city charters and it makes it a leak, Ill, really illegal and a fraudulent behavior. Mm -hmm. First of all, if there's something of an emergency, the elected official has to come back to the citizens to say, is this a priority? And we need to bring it to a vote if that is very important. So you do not have the right to spend the taxpayer's money at your own discretion. The judge even ruled that it was inappropriate and they've um, actually paid back some of the money into the bureau's budget. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So, so Nick's position is what? Nick's position is that Nick has been a show on spending the taxpayers' money, okay. and it's time for him to, you know, to basically go back to his practice. And that's why I'm here because I want to represent you, the citizens of the 95 neighborhoods in the city of Portland, to make sure your voice is heard, that we do what the people are asking, and that we make sure that your dollars are being effective, efficiently spent, so that we don't have this problem in the future. You know, I, I would again, I would ask you just. And I, and I think we're going to, I fall in that same ring. How do you think the media has treated you at this point in time? Well, do you think it's fairly to a certain degree? Have they treated you fairly? You know, the media is basically focused on the incumbents mm -hmm. because they're focused on money. And But what they're not recognizing is that it's time to wake up. Yes. Wake up, yes. wake up, Portland, because there's too much. Sounds like Tom Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I like it. I but, like it. but really, there's a lot of things going no, no, on right. in the city that yes. we people have been really lulled to yes. sleep. Right. And I think they're really dulled in their senses about what needs to be corrected and changed. But it starts with real, true leadership that has the courage to be able to take on the challenges, address the issues, and ask the hard questions. Day one, that's what I'm going to be doing, is asking the hard questions, holding the right people accountable, making sure that taxpayers' dollars are being used efficiently and effectively. Boy, isn't that something? Wake up, folks. That's what Tom Peterson wake used to up. say. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Right. Get those ballots in your hand. Pull yes. out your voters' pamphlets. Yes. And isn't, isn't she exciting? Get those ballots <laughs> and start voting, folks. I mean, we need change. We need yes. change. I tell you, we definitely need change. And I won't, I won't go beyond that point at this point in time on Nick, but we will get back to this. Yes. We, gotta, we don't have enough time. Teresa, another exciting young lady here. That just, she's put a name in the hat. And the, hey, I'm not like as that. exciting as Sharon, yeah, yeah. and well, I no, voted no, for no, her. No, you, 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 you're, you're, exciting. You're, you're, you're exciting, too. But I don't know. Go on, won't you talk to the voters? Here. Just share with them exactly one 
why you're running for office here, and and uh, what are some of you, what are some of the issues that you're having with the the person, the sitting person right now, oh, with Loretta Smith? Talk to talk to us. Well, actually, uh, a lot of the viewers have seen me on your show before. My name is Teresa Rayford. I'm running for Multnomah County Commissioner for District Two, which is North and Northeast Portland, and about 35 of the neighborhoods that Sharon mentioned in her intro. And um, most of the issues that I have is not only. I don't want to say that they're de directly related to Loretta, but directly related to how we process our democracy in this community. Uh, we have rules of engagement as it pertains to our Constitution and also the democratic process. And what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of bias in how that is generated and how it's being distributed, and especially in this election here. And um, a media is a big issue. You know, I, I believe that their endorsements are predetermined, and you can kind of see that when you go into the settings where you're being interviewed. Uh, I looked at the Willamette Weekly, and they had said, you know, it looks like Teresa was in their sleep, yeah. and you were sitting there with me. I was right me. there. You were and, not uh, sleeping. <laughs> I, I wasn't sleeping. I was answering the questions as they, they brought were. them to me, but I didn't want to have, uh, uh, I didn't want to be yeah. entertaining right. Right. in a situation where we're talking about real people's exactly. lives, because I'm not in this for a game or for, you know, to, to promote my resume or to build my skill set. I'm qualified based on the constitutional rules as to why you want to uh, serve in public office. But uh, it seemed like they wanted us to be entertaining, and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling that. And so I didn't want to get into the same thing that Kelvin and Loretta were getting into while we were sitting there trying to take things seriously. Um, and a lot of that has just been continuous. And even with the Democratic Party right now, her office is located in the Multnomah County Dems office where, you know, I was registered as a PCP. I had been elected by ballot to be so. And I go in there and, you know, there's Loretta Smith stuff there, her her signs in her office. You know, that's her campaign headquarters. Wait a minute. And, her office is in the? Uh, 3551 Northeast Sandy at the Multnomah County Dems uh, building. Is that allowable? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, they, they have a lease. Uh, they've done some construction work over there that's supposed to be, I guess, I don't know if it was approved or not, but it's just, uh, it, it shows voters that if you're a hardcore Democrat and you vote Democrat, if the Democrats are favoring this opponent over another one, it kind of, to me, shows favoritism. Mm -hmm. And so while I've been out there canvassing for the last couple of months, a lot of people that are now turning in their ballots that I'm just now hitting doors, uh, some of them haven't voted at all and they mm -hmm. don't intend to vote or they didn't intend to vote because they felt like their party pick was not what they wanted and they didn't know enough about the other candidates. There wasn't enough support and most of the things that were put in the newspaper about me had nothing to do with my race or my challenge. I mean, they kept bringing up something that happened between Loretta Smith and Baruti and I know that you've had that issue on your show, but uh, that had nothing to do with me. I wasn't one of the community members that went to her and told her that she should back off when that happened. I read in one of the articles that the newspaper said, yeah, black leaders had approached her and told her that she, you know, she needed to back off. Well, I wasn't among them. And at the time that that situation happened between them, I was the state director of UniteWomen.org, which is a national women's organization that deals with sexual violence against women, rape, harassment, pay equity, and all these different things that, you know, she could have brought those concerns yeah. to me. I was also the business and community uh, chair for the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs, which she was the treasurer of. And she never came to me. We've never had a conference regarding that incident. So I didn't understand why the media put that on me. You know, as a person that uh, works in that field of industry, I do it because I was a victim. I'm a survivor. And so I take those things very seriously. So to offend my character, with that type of jargon and, you know, assumptions or whatever, um, it just, it's, it's unappealing. And it, it basically, it hurts the people that asked me to run, which were people in our community. You know, I'm worrying for the elderly people in our community, people with disabilities. There's a lot of houseless families that I work with, a lot of people in the foster care system. And those people are depending on somebody that understands their experiences and can work with policymakers and politicians to change the direction of how we systematically uh, provide those services to them. And that's what I'm running for. That's what I want to do as a county commissioner. But we have all of these, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I might, I might issues. add, I might so. add. It's kind of like saying we all, we all, we have five people running uh, for the county because, in all due respect, the Red wears two hats. 
Sure. You know, she's a sitting sitting commissioner, mm -hmm. and she's a candidate. Yes. And realistically, she should be the candidate. Right. Not a sitting commissioner. I thought about you that know, as well. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. same thing with Fish. Mm -hmm. Fish is the same boat. Yes. He's got two hats. You've run as two people. Yes. Right? So, so that's that is an issue, and I think they need to understand about dotting the i's and crossing the t's. Right. But unfortunately, the media reacts to the sitting commissioners mm -hmm. or the city council person. You sure. got my point? Sure. As opposed to addressing the issues yes. that they had talked about exactly. while he was sitting in office or while she was sitting in office. They, don't, they tend to refrain from that. Yes. But give her the opportunity, if you will, because you got all the other entities that are supporting her, this, that, and the other, again, are responding to their positions. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the unions, on the other hand, if they were dealing with it from the standpoint of what are the issues of today, right. they would be a little bit more open-minded and Absolutely. listen to what's being said by the folks. This is not about a personal attack uh, on the on the on the position. Right. This is about the issues of today yes. and kind of everyday like, people. That's right. Yeah. You know, you spent some time in this mm -hmm. area here, and did you respond to the issues of the voters and the taxpayers? And on that's exactly. the problem, and the that's issues. the thing that we're having problem with on the issue. Right. So let's so on that end of, end of it. Let's go around the table again. We'll start with you, mm -hmm. Teresa. In regards to now, she's wearing the hat. From the standpoint of the incumbent, incumbent, she's a sitting commissioner. Do you feel that she's performed her jobs over the last four years? Absolutely okay. not, or I wouldn't areas? be running. Okay, so what would um, what be some of the well, areas? Well, public specifics? safety, when I first started working within District 2 as a community member uh, doing direct engagement, it was when sitting uh, commissioner Barbara Wheeler was the District 2 commissioner. And Barbara Wheeler had brought a lot of women. It was 40 women, and we called ourselves the Black Women for Peace. And she brought us together so that we could deal with the public safety as it pertains to the black youth in the community that were committing violence against each other uh, because of the poverty. And during the time that I was engaged with this group of women, I actually lost my nephew uh, to gun violence. And so I've been fighting for gun legislation and things of that sort. But as a continuum, I'm looking at the issue of poverty which includes our education system, which includes our public safety, which includes the relationships that we have with seniors and making sure that they have resources. Because in District 2, a lot of the seniors are the parents of these children that are out here. And so if we don't give them a, a sustainable foundation, they're not going to be able to help the children as they're getting educated. They're not, those children aren't going to be the career-focused children that we need to make sure that the next millennial of generation in Portland is basically contributing to society. They're going to be the ones that are going into the prison system and different things of that sort. And so I think that by not focusing directly on public safety and the poverty issue, that we are at a loss in our community. And that's one of the main things that I think that she hasn't had a, a, a direct engagement with. She's not out there. I mean, uh, somebody had commented in an article on the Oregonian that said that my photos on Facebook look like photo ops. I don't get an opportunity to do a photo op. I work seven days a week in my community. What do you mean you by that, the photo ops? She, <laughs> she's getting it. Yeah, well, saying that I was doing photo ops, oh, I they, see. you okay. know, it was okay. an article that was basically the endorsement article about her, but it had so much information about me. And then one of the things that was said was that, oh, well, Miss Rayford has all these photos on her Facebook page that, you know, she's doing these photo ops. And I was like, wow, that's ridiculous because anybody that knows me knows that I volunteer seven days a week. I'm working out there and I'm working on these issues seven days a week. I'm taking them to Salem. I'm taking them to county. I'm taking them to city hall. You know, I'm helping uh, educate people on how to deal with their own issues by learning process. So uh, I don't have time for a photo op. If I'm smiling and taking a picture, it's because that community okay. member wants to take a picture with me. But I'm not out there looking for photo ops. Okay. Sharon, let's talk about Fish wearing the hat as, uh, as the incumbent, the sitting commissioner. What, what sure, are some of the concerns sure. you have? In well, definitely when I met with Mr. Fish on January the 2nd, and I asked him to convince me not to run. Yeah. And um, the things that he brought up around his track record were unconvincible. That's why I'm here. I'm running because I haven't seen him doing anything that really amounts to too much. When you take a the Portland Housing Bureau and turn it around to something else, and you take the $357 million that should go to low-income affordable housing and give it to the wealthy developers, interest-free, basically grants, and that money should have gone for low-income housing throughout the city of Portland. Did, to he, the, did he respond to you in regards to that? When you oh, asked yes. He said that he um, created the Bud Clark Commons. Wow, I think that's like one project, maybe about $6 million. Really? I just said that's unacceptable. And so with that, 
um, how do you give out $357 million? And the auditor's report states that the city doesn't expect to be paid back but 15% of that money. And that's not even a probability that that would even come back in. So now we have an issue as it relates to affordable housing, low-income housing, when we've had so many people lose their jobs when the economy went down in 2008. You have people working two and three jobs trying to uh, come up with enough money to pay the high rents when they've been totally displaced and gentrified out of North Northeast Portland to outer east and also throughout the rest of the city. It's just devastating to see how people have uh, are not able to afford to pay the rents. A uh, rent that used to be only $500 in North Northeast Portland is now over $1,200, so it's almost doubled or triple. How does a sitting commissioner allow that to happen to the people that live in this city. It's very unacceptable. So when he brought that up and he's using that as a part of his, um, you know, that he cares for the little guy, I say not so. You don't represent the, the, the average everyday citizen. You're working for the one percenters. And this city is made up of all people. All people matter. And it's time now to have a real public servant as myself, a small business owner who has worked to connect with everyday people, providing living wage jobs with benefits. As a general contractor, I know what it is to make a budget. I know what it is to get projects and to hire the right people mm -hmm. and to make sure that my people are valued and that they recognize that they can contribute in their local community. I don't think Mr. Fish has that, over, that vision or is he able to connect because he puts himself way above the people? Mm -hmm. You know, another area that I, I want to talk about is that, as you know, the city of Portland pretty well incorporates most of, most of the district number two. In fact, the district number two is the largest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, money is always an issue. Yes, it and is. And that's been one of my concerns from the standpoint of saying, show me the money. Right. And a single system district, that, that would definitely set it in place. Yes, right? a single uh, member districts would allow a better accountability. Yes, right. It would allow an alignment to make sure that what the county is doing and what other regional partners, when we're looking for how the money is being used, then we can work with our county partner, our regional par uh, partners, when it comes to making sure that the dollars are being used effectively and efficiently. It makes no sense that we've had billions and billions of dollars come to this city to, first of all, uh, renovate the blighted areas of the city, and that money has been diverted outside of those neighborhoods to other areas, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why we've seen the destruction and the devastating, devastation here in the inner north, northeast Portland. The, it should have been the existing residents who were able to benefit from those dollars, not just the newcomers coming here mm -hmm. that... Uh, Sam Adams and Nick Fish, because he was part of this last four years uh, prior to Charlie Hills coming in, taking our monies and recruiting people to come to the city of Portland. I just don't see that as the way that a city should work. When you're talking about making sure that all people have a quality of life and success in the city, it's time to make sure that we're hearing all voices and that we work to make sure that the dollars economically are being used to invest in human capital. That means that people have the ability to either get the training, to get jobs, that we help businesses to hire more local people so that we have more uh, local dollars in the economy. It's, ju it's just a no-brainer to have a single member districts so that you have the four districts for city commissioner, that they're connecting with citizens in those districts so that they understand what the infrastructure project needs are, the capital development, the housing needs, the homeless needs. I mean, we could do so much more. And it's time for cor correction right now. And the single member district will allow us to perform those audits and give citizens a better opportunity for input, by having the town halls, by having more uh, community participation, and speaking to real issues that matter to people. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, along that same, thing, same line, I think it's very important that we need to have extend this uh, the, the discussion, if you will. Oh yes, that's why we need a we need to get into the next rung, and that it's not just quote just want to take all on the front end. Sure, you know I mean? sure. Uh, it's a very important piece, and what comes to mind is the whole issue with the housing thing. You know, I'm very familiar with Mr. Rudman. I've dealt with Mr. Rudman some time before. And when you start thinking about vouchers being issued, vouchers being issued 
outside of the city limits right to the Gresham areas and yes. this, that, and the other. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. And so it's kind of like saying, who's controlling the county? Exactly. Yeah, who's controlling the county? Exactly. 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 The exactly. city is controlling the county. It's Ex a big machine. Yes, yes. And that was another one of the triggers for me in running for office is because I was saying, who is holding the city accountable? Who's holding the yeah. county accountable? If the people, if we, the citizens who elect the elected officials, can't hold them accountable, then we have to rise up. And that's why... Portlanders, uh, we need you to get those ballots yes, out. We so. need oh you to goodness. pick up the voters' ball, uh, uh, pamphlet and take a look to see who the candidates are. I am Sharon Maxwell. I am a public servant. You can trust me as a business owner, as a mother, as someone who has built transient fences where the homeless have been there every morning when my crews have arrived there. I've seen people put out and living uh, in caves up under bridges. It's time to turn the city around to make sure that all people that live in the 95 neighborhoods have a quality of life. It's time to make sure that our schools have the adequate and the adequate funding to make sure we have 21st century world-class schools. It's time to make sure that all of our neighborhoods, not just Northwest, Southwest, not just the inner Southeast, but all of our 95 neighborhoods are developed, have a quality, a standard of life for all people, that all people have the ability to contribute and give input into how their neighborhoods look and how safe they are and that the jobs can be in every neighborhood. That's why I'm running, Bruce. Yeah, That's yeah. why I'm running, Teresa, yeah, yeah. is because we need real leadership, and I'm bringing that day one. And you know, I'm going to I'm I'm, okay. I'm go right to you, Teresa. In fact, uh, that's gonna, that's my concern, too, being that I'm running with the whole group to a certain degree. But the bottom line is that um, that is another issue with reference to how the media is playing, playing this off. They always identify it as Northeast Portland. Yes. You know, this is not just a black district. No, no. it's not. You know, no. It's not just a black district, but, but the media pushes it that way. Yes, And yes. I noticed that and from a Loretta standpoint, the idea of that she's going to she provided a hundred jobs, if you will, to African Americans. Yes. Well, I mean that's that's an insult. Well, she said summer jobs, and she said that she provided them for the youth, and that's over the last four years. But at the same time, she's voted against making sure that they get STEM technology and programs like the Benson Tech program that they have over there, that's teaching the children the science, technology, engineering, and math, teaching them how to build aircraft and automobiles, and they have a dental lab and all these things. They're voting against opportunities to get these children out of intergenerational poverty through apprenticeships and internships that pay 14 to 16 dollars an hour and take them into career fields that pay 60 to 80 thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. so if you're providing somebody with a summer job that's not even focused on the major that they're choosing in college which a lot of the students that i've seen i've seen at all the different places you know and i ask yeah. them hey what are you guys doing in here and oh we're looking at computers today or we're playing with kids today well what are you doing in college well i want to be an engineer well how does that work with what you're doing here? And do you have any of that hands-on experience? And they don't. We're just giving them jobs that are available through the relationships that are coming through the uh, resources that they're coming from, like the $1 million that they just provided or that she just asked for in the budget for SCI and well, for what, their wraparound services. I didn't services. get that. What was that? Oh, again? Well, you're running I, against her, Bruce. You I, should I, know I, what the budget is. I didn't get that. I just, I just <laughs> well, you, you should know about the $1 million that's, the one million that she's dollars. asked for, actually, yeah, to go to, SCI, to, uh, to culturally specific and to children of color. And one of the things that I've said a lot is that we need to desegregate the system. If we keep focusing on the color of the people that we're serving and not the issues that they're dealing with, then we're going to miss a big issue. And that's uh, taking them out of the poverty. We're, we're telling kids that they're disadvantaged simply because their skin is brown. And then we're serving the funding that we get for disadvantaged youth to children that are eligible to be in a program where a lot of the disadvantaged youth are not available to go. They're not qualified to be in those programs, but they're actually getting that money. And so we're, we're leaving a lot of people out because we're playing that race card. But are we getting the money? We're well, not we, getting the money. money. I mean, we were at the Willamette Weekly. Teams. We were at the Willamette Weekly yeah, interview, and I looked at that on the uh, video, and she said that 70% of the money that comes into Multnomah County is in Salem. And I'm trying to understand, what does she mean by that? <laughs> well, let's do the same. well, you know, yeah. I just really have to speak so. to this. Um, single member districts yes. will allow us to really convene all of the players right. to the table to identify what their strengths are, where our weaknesses are, where the gaps are when it comes to nonprofit organizations, city services, county services. That's how you're, we're going to hold yeah. everyone yeah. accountable for all the billions of dollars right. that are at the county and coming through the city's coffers to make sure that all people, we first have to start with adults, 
making sure that parents have quality jobs and that they're able to role model and mentor their own children. Okay, the day is over to where we're just uh, sending a little bit of money here, $100,000 as a business owner, I know that $100,000 for me is barely one project. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about an investment and investing in the lives of people in communities and cities and in building people, that takes a real strategic plan that brings all the players to the table that says, where do we need to focus on so that we can, first of all, correct the issues that are at hand. And that's part of the city's problem and the county's problem. And day one, that's what I'm going to be doing as new city commissioner is focusing on a strategic plan through single member districts calling forth all the players to the table they call it convening to make sure we know where the dollars are being used who really needs those dollars and if those programs are being effective and efficient and you can get that from an audit but at the same time what really needs to happen within district two you know because that's what I'm running is we need to build direct engagement with the people in the district because their voices do matter when you look at board okay when you look at uh, board meetings on the you know on Portland community media or you're looking at them at the Multnomah County District website those meetings take place at 930 in the morning when we're talking about town halls and speaking to the people and making sure that they understand what the issues are, that means that we have to walk outside of our building mm -hmm. and go into right. those neighborhoods and connect right. directly with them where mm -hmm. they stand. Mm -hmm. And if it's 35 communities, then you just have to make sure that you mark it on your calendar and that you're consistent and that there's follow-up involved. We don't have that right now. When we talk about transparency at some of the forums that we've been in, you know, she can taunt and say, well, we're very transparent. Well, of course you are from nine to five. Monday through Friday on the website, everybody doesn't have access. We're talking about a district that is very poor. You know, our unemployment rate is in the double digits. We're, we're a very poor district. Those people don't have the time to come to Multnomah County to speak to them during the time that they're available to be available to the people. So. Well, got this last minute. Uh, this has been <laughs> just great. I would suggest, that, again, that has been another of my focus because I've been in media for so long. We almost need to hold a press conference once a week yes. at the city, well, city hall, the county, and the whole nine yards. There you because, go. Like you said, uh, people don't have access to be able to go in in the morning and during the week. They work every day. You sure. know, that kind of a deal. Sure. And, uh, and then I guess the other thing is that hopefully they will, by getting into the general election, however it, it fares, if you will, uh, maybe the media might take up with some of the concerns about the single member district. Yes. It makes a lot of sense. Yes. But they didn't share that because you weren't the incumbents. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes. we're not the incumbents in that right. manner. So again, that's why we're doing this show. That's why we're encouraging you to, hey, get that voters pamphlet out. And I'm saying the voters pamphlet. Yes. Take the voters pamphlet out. Get that voters pamphlet out. Pull those pull those voters, those ballots that you've thrown in the in the well on the side, set on the side, and vote, folks. Yes. Regardless of who you vote. vote for, but vote. Get out there and exercise your right. It's very, very important to do that, okay? Yep. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, and here are these two ladies. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, it's just Bruce. been great. Good luck. Thank good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck, Bruce. Good, good luck, <laughs> no. Teresa. Good luck, Teresa. This <laughs> is just great. Bruce good luck, good luck at all, right? <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, good. Hey, folks, have a good one. Again, get out and vote. Please vote, 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 vote. It's very, very important, okay? Take care. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. See you next week. We'll be talking about the end of it. Vote. 13 percent right. is not vote, a good vote, number. Vote. 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 Good. <laughs>